In 2008, I worked at a retail clothing store with my girlfriend, Chelsea. We were both 18 years old and we tried to work as many shifts together as possible to maximize our time together because she was still in school. My grandfather had recently purchased a Dodge Sprinter van for his business and my car was being serviced overnight, so I got to drive the van. Chelsea and I loved the nights we got to take the van. Because it usually had the back seats installed and the tinted windows meant we could have some privacy, which is great for teens who still live at home. That night, we only had one row of seats in the back, just behind the driver and passenger. Chelsea and I parked near each other like we always did and worked our evening shift, closing the store with a few of our co-workers. We all leave together and I help the manager lock up because the glass doors need to be aligned properly for the lock to engage. It's early March in Pennsylvania and it's still very cold outside so Chelsea usually starts her car to warm it up and then sits with me as my car warms up. When I get to the vehicles, her car is idling and she's already in the van. I don't even realize that I still have the keys and I never unlocked the doors. She sits with me, chatting for a while. She then sits on my lap and we kiss in the front seats, but we decide it's too late and too cold to have a little fun in the back. Every night we drive home separately from work while talking on the phone. She usually gets home first and I stay on the line while she walks up her long driveway in the dark. That night, I made it home first for some reason and I knew I had a lot of stuff to carry in, so when I'm close to home I tell her that I'll call her in a little bit. She asks me to stay on the line because she's almost home and she doesn't like walking past the dark bushes next to her driveway. I stay on the phone and fumble with all of my things I'm carrying out of the van. I know I locked and armed the van because as I was using the key fob to lock the vehicle I dropped a few things while struggling to keep the phone to my ear. The motion lights have illuminated the whole area so I'm able to see everything that I dropped. We both make it inside safely and we also decide not to stay on the phone because she had school in the morning. I begin to doze off almost immediately in my bedroom. I lived with my grandparents who built a house to accommodate for my grandfather's aging parents suffering from Alzheimer's, my great-grandparents, so that they didn't have to go into a home. The driveway runs parallel to a daylight basement that has two garage doors, an entrance door, and the French doors to my bedroom. I'm falling asleep as all of the motion lights finally turn off and now my room is completely dark. It wasn't even 20 minutes later when I'm jarred awake by the alarm sirens of the van. All of the motion lights are on and the flashing lights of the van's alarm are filling my room. I left the key fob upstairs in the main part of the house so I run upstairs to silence the alarm. In the kitchen, as I'm grabbing the fob, my grandfather in his boxers, my great grandmother in her nightgown, and I in my boxer briefs all meet in the dark. My grandfather grunts as he sees me grabbing the fob, but what my granny said sent shivers down my spine. She basically asked why the hell I was running around outside at this time of night. I wasn't outside. I explained that I was sleeping and she insisted that I was outside making the van alarm. My great-grandparents' bedroom sits above the garage doors looking down over the driveway and the van. I'm assuming she's confused, she has Alzheimer's after all. The goosebumps from her exclamation prompted me to grab a knife from the butcher block anyway and my grandfather followed with a baseball bat. We both walk outside warily, in our boxers, in the cold but highly illuminated and loud, dead of night. The van is still going crazy. The interior lights are all flashing and I remember that specifically because I'd never seen a car alarm do that. We silence the alarm and start looking around. My grandfather says he thinks a deer may have run out of the woods in the dark and hit the van. I don't say anything as we investigate. When I reach the back of the van I notice the door is wide open. That explains the alarm. The van has a feature that if the vehicle alarm is armed and a door is open somehow from inside or outside, it alarms. But how? I locked it and armed it, hence the blaring alarm. 
That's when I realized the door was opened from the inside. My blood ran cold. The door is open so the inside lights are still on. I see the empty space behind the row of seats and there are wadded up napkins and a chip bag. They weren't ours. Someone was in the van with me the entire time. I must have left the van unlocked by mistake when I went into work and that's how Chelsea was able to get into the van without the keys at the end of the night. Was it a homeless person escaping the cold or someone with a more sinister intent? What if I had gotten off the phone like I wanted to? If they had bad intentions, the fact that I was on the phone might have saved my life because Chelsea would have raised hell if she heard me being attacked. I get chills every time I think about it. We didn't call the police because my grandfather was skeptical of my conclusion, but my gut tells me that I didn't drive home alone that night. When I was 11, my family of six decided to make the move from suburbia to a lovely rural bungalow. I have three sisters, aged 9, 12, and 18 at the time. We were all excited for the privacy and isolation of our new home. For once in our lives, we would have no neighbors and a large yard to play in. Our home had large picture windows giving us a beautiful view of the farmland around us. My parents dislike curtains because there were no neighbors and they collect dust, so we all figured, what's the point? The summer was so much fun there. Every morning I would get up and take my dog for a walk around the woods in our backyard. I absolutely adored the feeling of being alone and was enjoying the freedom of all of our new space. Fall eventually rolled around and I continued my routine of walking my dog both in the morning and after school. I remember one morning while walking my dog I began to feel uncomfortable. I was alone in the woods, there was no one around, but I still felt as though I was being watched. I had shivers down my back the entire walk and for an 11 year old I just felt really strange. My dog was acting weird too. I kept trying to go farther into the woods but she kept trying to pull me towards our shed. The shed rested at the very back of our yard on the edge of the woods where the trees thin out quite a bit. I didn't like how I was feeling so I took my dog and brought her back to the house and went on with my day. Days went by and I just couldn't seem to shake this feeling of being watched. Especially when I was in my bedroom which had a huge window in it that overlooked our backyard. The view of the woods that I had previously loved was beginning to scare me. I assumed it was just because it was fall and the forest started looking kind of gloomy, I guess. I started having nightmares about waking up in the middle of the night and seeing the figure of a man in our backyard. Weird things kept happening around our house. We all suddenly noticed that we were eating things like bread a lot quicker. Every morning half a loaf of bread would be gone and my parents attributed this to their hungry, growing children. One evening, I woke up and heard noises coming from our family kitchen which was just down the hall from my bedroom. It sounded like someone had come home and I assumed it was my oldest sister. The only thing that was strange was her footsteps sounded a lot heavier than they usually do. The noise stopped very quickly and I was able to fall back asleep. In the morning, my mom asked me and my two sisters, the 9 year old and the 12 year old ones, if we woke up last night to make food. We all said no, and then I asked if it was my oldest sister. My mom told me that she stayed at her friend's house last night and then thought it was probably the dog making noise. I knew better than that though. I was terrified. I knew I heard unfamiliar footsteps. That night I had a lot of trouble sleeping. I still felt like someone was watching me. Eventually, I had fallen asleep but woke up around 2.30am. 
I heard noises in the house again. It was the same footsteps I had heard before. I stayed in my bed and felt paralyzed. I rolled over and faced the window hoping that if someone came in my room they'd think I was asleep. The noises stopped and I closed my eyes as hard as I could. I told myself I was just imagining things and that monsters aren't real. About an hour must have gone by and I eventually opened my eyes. When I looked out the window, I swear to God, I could see a man standing in our backyard watching our house. Here's a photo that contains a cheesy edit of where I saw him. I was terrified enough that I didn't move at all and eventually fell asleep again. I was so relieved to wake up alive that morning but was still terrified of our backyard. I ran into the kitchen to tell my mom what I saw and refused to walk the dog. I'm not sure if she really believed me at the time or thought I was having night terror hallucinations, which I did have quite often when I was younger. I went to school that morning. I was anxious all day, the last thing I wanted to do was go home. When I did get home, I saw police vehicles surrounding the house. They had the dogs with them and were searching our yard. They told us a man who had broken into another home had beaten the couple living there and was suspected of being on our property. He stole their wallets, photos, and other small items of value. The biggest thing he stole was their car which had been ditched 10 kilometers from our home. While searching our property, they found all the items from his previous break-in hidden around our yard. They also discovered that he had been hiding in our shed since his previous break-in. They said he had done this at the previous home prior to breaking in. He would spend time watching the house and observing the resident's routine until he knew it well enough to start coming inside the house. They said he had a long history of premeditated violence including child abuse and they believed he was planning on eventually harming us. In the shed, they found wrappers, empty cans of food, and scraps. They told us he was definitely coming into our house for food at night. From the shed, he had a perfect view of our home and could see when we all went to bed. Although they searched our house and property with the dogs, they didn't find him. After that day, I realized that if you feel like you're being watched, you probably are. The writer of this story's first language isn't English, so cut them some slack on the word choice. One night, I stayed at my campus until late at night. It was about 1am in the morning that I decided to go home. On the front gate of my campus, there was no public transport left, so I had to take the one that's farther away and I needed to walk for 10 minutes before I got there. The path which I had to take has no street lights, so it was dark. In the middle of my path, there was a woman who I knew about. She lived near my boarding house. I've seen her around the area a couple times. It seemed like we were going the same way. I didn't really think much about it at first, but then she looked over her shoulder and she walked a bit faster. The next thing I know, I was left alone there. After I finally arrived at the main street, there was a bus parked at the side of the street waiting for people to board it. As soon as I got onto the bus, I noticed that the same woman as before was on the bus too. She looked terrified when she saw me, and then she changed seats, moving further away from me. I then realized that she probably thought I was a stalker. It was funny for me until I realized that I would get off the bus at the same time as her, and she might really think that I was stalking her then. I was confused. After all, what could I do? Should I try to talk to her and say, Hey, I might be big and scary, but I'm just a normal college boy who lives in the boarding house near your house. But that would be awkward, so I decided not to. Finally, I get off the bus, and yes, she got off there too, of fucking course. My boarding house is located in a private housing complex. 
To get there, I need to walk in a small alley first. That night, the alley was very dark, and that woman was running in a hurry towards the alley because she thought I was after her. I walked slowly, thinking that if she didn't see me right behind her, she might feel safe and let all of this go. I was very wrong. Because just when I was about to go in the housing complex, there she was, looking terrified and started screaming at me. I really didn't know what to do, so I just approached her and told her to calm down. I was right about to explain everything when she took out a kitchen knife from her bag. The situation intensifies quickly. I jumped back and told her that I am not a stalker. She didn't believe me and came at me with a knife. I was about to run when a boy who lives in the same boarding house as me passed us. He obviously knew something wasn't right, so he approached us. He told the woman, who was confused as fuck, that I live in the boarding house. I then apologized to her, but she was still upset and left, still looking at us with her judging eyes when she walked out. I made sure she was already far from me when I finally thanked the guy who saved me and told him everything. He laughed at me, but I couldn't laugh. I just had a knife swung at me and it scared me. So yeah, the woman who lives near me, I'm not a stalker and I have no intention to stalk you whatsoever. So please don't think about me as a bad guy who followed you home the other night. I'm a college-age male in my first semester of freshman year at a state university. Less than half an hour ago, I was coming back from breakfast when another student who I've never met before started following me. He was maybe 25, 30 feet behind me, far enough away as to not be in my general vicinity, so I thought nothing of it. I get to the entrance doors of my dorm and swipe my keycard. The dorms are protected by a scanner, allowing me to access the building. As a quick disclaimer, my back has been bothering me the last week or so. I could barely get the door open for me to get through without a spike of pain shooting up my spine. The only reason I was up and at him today was because a midterm was due. I would have held the door open for the guy, but it hurt to even hold it open. And he was quite a ways away and was unlikely to speed up, so... I didn't want to be in pain for that long. Dick move, I know, and evidently he thought so too because as I let it shut behind me, I could see in the window to my right his reflection, his head lurching forward and eyes widening in a, really? You really just did that? You asshole, kind of look. I sighed and got ready to apologize as he came in behind me. Still moving down the hall because I needed to get back to my room to pack for class. He came in and didn't say a word. At which I thought, fair enough, but I did notice that he was picking up his pace. The way the entry hallway of our building is set up. There's the entry doors at either side which feed into the lobby, where there's doors on the left to the RA's office, the right to the dorm lounge, and the stairs straight ahead. I head toward the stairs straight ahead, expecting to hear the door to the lounge being perhaps somewhat angrily jerked open. But nope, these faster footsteps are coming with me up the stairs. I was at the landing halfway up the stairs, as I live on the second floor, when he got to the stairs. I saw that he was skipping two or three stairs at a time, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw he was looking at me. Glaring, even. I decided to pick up my pace a little. As I got to the top of the stairs and made a left to get to the door to my hall, he, almost at the top of the stairs, said in a rather confrontational tone, Hey, pal. Wanna talk for a minute? Between the embarrassment, the aggression to his movements and anger in his voice, added on to the pain in my back slowing me down to more of a speed limp than anything, I quickly muttered a sorry and made sure to get on the other side of the door as fast as possible. He wasn't taking it though. And when I began to speed walk down my hall back to my room I heard that door slam open behind me. 
It was one of those ones that had the press bar to open and I could tell he'd angrily shoved it. I basically went to a full run and heard him shout, Hey bro, come back, I just want to teach you some manners. Thank fuck I'd had that head start on him, because I managed to get to my room, unlock the door, get in, and slam it just as he got to it. I relocked the door and held my weight against it just to be safe as he pounded on it with his fists and yelled, Come on man, I just want to teach you some manners you fat fucking prick. I thought we were bros man. What, you just gonna fucking hide in there? Our hallway was used to people being rowdy, obnoxious, and loud at all hours because I guess that's who they let into honors nowadays. Not to mention most of them were at class anyway, so nobody came into the hall to call this guy on his bullshit. I threatened to call the campus PD or the RAs to haul this guy away and I think he got the message because I can't hear him out there anymore. Nor can I see him through the peephole. What concerns me is that he lives in our dorm because our security keycards only work on the buildings we live in, and he knows where my room is. I'm really hoping I never meet him again. This story is told from a female's perspective. My New Year resolution 2012 was to get into shape again. After my first kid was born, I had lost my athletic interest, but I had every intention of getting it back. So I started running four days a week with my friend Hannah, who is a great runner and motivator. We would run after work five, maybe ten kilometers, usually favoring the forest trail. It's the kind of trail that has lighting in the darker months of the year. So you can run there anytime, really. Once you turn on the lights, you have 45 minutes to run the shorter trails and longer to run the longer trails. Then the light shut off automatically. We had been running for about two months when we started seeing the same man hanging around the parking lot every time we got there. Thin man, 25, 30 years of age, always dressed in sports clothes but never actually running. He never looked you in the eye, either. We speculated that he could be homeless camping nearby because he was constantly there. We got used to seeing him, sitting somewhere close by, silently and always on his own. We felt sorry for him. He never seemed to talk to anyone or interact at all. But there was something about him that made us hesitate to talk to him or ask if he was okay. I can't pinpoint what it was, but something wasn't completely right about him. One evening, Hannah didn't make it to our run and I decided to go on my own. I arrived at the parking lot, my car being the only car there. I did some stretching, turned on the lights, and set off on the 5 kilometer trail. I hadn't seen the thin silent man when I started my run. Perhaps it was getting too cold to sit there now that it was autumn, dark, and getting closer to the freezing point. He must have been there though. Somewhere in the shadows, because when I got to the top of the first steep hill, I could hear heavy breathing somewhere behind me. I look over my shoulder and I see him. He's running like a man obsessed, in regular shoes, not running shoes, with his arms moving in a really strange, stiff manner as if he was made of metal, his hands like arrows straight in an upward angle. Sort of like a sprinter, but more extreme, moving like a robot. For the first time, he looked me straight in the eyes, and it was the eyes of a predatory animal and it made my heart freeze. He had never done anything to harm me, or anyone else as far as I knew, but the look in his eyes alone was enough to let me know that I was facing a serious, serious threat. I started running faster, trying to create distance between us and I could hear his heavy breathing getting more and more strained. I ran like my life depended on it, adrenaline pumping through my body and giving me new strength. I tore off my necklace and threw it on the ground thinking, I must leave a trace if he takes me, something must be left behind. 
I tried screaming, hoping that someone would be close enough to hear me. But I couldn't scream my lungs out and keep up the pace at the same time. Why is he doing this? What does he want? Who is he? I thought as I started to feel my lungs burn. Then I thought of my 15 month old daughter and ran until I could taste blood in my mouth. He was still behind me, maybe 100 meters behind me now, but I figured that if I trip and fall, or run out of energy, or fumble with the car keys once I reach the parking lot, then I'm screwed. So once I reached the sharp turn on the trail, I went off the trail and ran straight into the dark woods. I ran only a short distance and then I laid down flat on my stomach, my hand searching for a rock to defend myself with if he found me. I realized that I was wearing bright running clothes with reflectors and neon coloring. I had never felt so visible in the dark before. I could hear him reach the turn and, thank God, he kept on running. I started to slowly and as silently as possible move further into the darkness. My heart sank again as soon as I heard rapid footsteps closing in from the trail. He had realized that I must have gone off the trail once he saw that there was no sign of me ahead. He stopped, and I stopped. I could imagine him listening for any sound, and I held my breath and begged a god I don't believe in to make him go away. After a while, I heard him say something in a language I didn't recognize, and he walked off. I didn't move. I feared that he would wait for me by the car and realize that I had to get off the trail and onto the main road and stop someone. I couldn't go back to the parking lot. I started to make my way further into the woods, knowing that I would eventually end up on the last part of the long trail and close to the main road. The lights on the trail suddenly shut off. That made me calmer at first. The dark was a comfort and protection. But then, after only a few moments, it switched on again. This could mean that another person had just started their run, and soon I would have someone there to help me. Or, that he was out looking for me. Or getting ready to prey on another lonely runner. I decided against waiting to find out, and continued my way towards the main road. It was dark and I fell multiple times, my clothes getting wet from the damp vegetation and I started to get cold. After what felt like a lifetime, I could see the 10 kilometer trail ahead and I knew I was close to the main road. Soon I could hear the traffic. Once I made it to the road, I must have looked like I was in a terrible accident. Blood from several cuts from the falling, my clothes dirty and my face, I assume, petrified. My bright runner shirt soon attracted the attention of a passing car. My waving and desperate shouting made it stop. The driver, a 40-ish man with his two kids in the backseat, spent the next 10 minutes or so trying to make sense of what I tried to say between the sobbing and crying. He asked if I wanted a ride back to the parking lot and I told him no, please just take me home instead. At home, my husband insisted on going to the parking lot to retrieve the car, and calling the police. And report what? I asked. No crime had been committed, I just knew he was out to get me. My husband went back for the car. The driver's seat window was smashed and my phone was gone. So was the photo of my daughter that I had hanging from the mirror. I don't know what he was trying to do, or why he chased me the way he did, but the look in his eyes, there was no doubt he had bad intentions. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video. I wanted to put something out that was a bit longer for you guys. I'm sorry if you've heard these stories before, I recorded them originally right after they were posted, but I couldn't upload this video until I had all the stories done. Regardless of whether you heard them or not, I hope you could still appreciate the video. Anyways, I wanted to ask, 
A lot of you keep asking where my old videos have gone, mainly the stalker ones like 1 through 11 I think. They're taken down to protect my channel from any potential issues. In most of these old videos, I have permission from the authors of at least two of the stories I had used in the video. I have over 10 videos taken down, so that's at least 20 stories plus taken off my channel. I was wondering if you guys wanted me to take the old stories from the taken down videos that I do have permission to use, and re-narrate them and post one long video of all my old stories. The only issue with that is that if you've listened to my old videos from before, you will have heard these stories before. Please let me know in the comments what you think of this. It's going to be a really time consuming process if I do end up doing it, so I want your honest opinion. And as always, send in your own personal stories to corpsehusbandstories at gmail.com. It will also be in the description of this video. And please include in the subject of the email what the story is about. Also, since I'm already talking and stuff, I just wanted to thank you all for 90,000 subscribers. It truly does mean the world to me. Those of you who saw my recent Snapchat story know what I have to go through just to put a video out for all of you. And the thought of that many people enjoying my videos is insane to me. 100,000 was a goal I was hoping to achieve in a few years, if I was lucky. Now I'm only 10,000 away. Thank you everyone for your constant support and have an awesome day.